Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses a section of the book titled Subspaces. Before we get started with subspaces, remember that F denotes either the field R of real numbers or the field C of complex numbers. From now on, let's also have the convention that V denotes a vector space over F. The advantage of having this assumption is that we do not need to keep putting in the hypothesis of each result let v be a vector space. The phrase vector space over f simply means that f is the scalar field. So for example, we call v a real vector space or a vector space over r when f is equal to r, and we call v a complex vector space or a vector space over c when f is the field of complex numbers c. The notion of subspace will lead us to a lot more examples of vector spaces. Here's the definition of subspace. A subset U of V is called a subspace of V if U is also a vector space using the same addition and scalar multiplication as on V. Let's look at a simple example. If we let U be the set of all elements of F3 whose third coordinate is 0, that's a subspace. Using the same addition and scalar multiplication as on V, this set is a vector space in its own right, and thus it is a subspace of F3. Before we give other examples of subspaces, let's look at this theorem, which gives an easy condition for checking whether a subset U of V is a subspace of V. Here's the result. A subset U of V is a subspace of V if and only if U satisfies the following three conditions. The first condition is that 0, the additive identity of V, is an element of U. The second condition is that U is closed under addition, meaning if we take any two vectors in U, their sum is also in U. The third condition is that U is closed under scalar multiplication, meaning that if we take any scalar and any element of U, the product is also an element of U. These three conditions are often easy to check. The reason that we do not need to check the other properties of a vector space is that they are automatically satisfied. For example, one of the conditions is commutativity of addition. But addition is clearly commutative in U because it's commutative in V, and U is a subset of V. Let's use this result to look at some other examples of subspaces. Remember, we just need to check these three properties, that we have the additive identity, that are set as closed under addition, and that is closed under scalar multiplication. For our first example, fix a number b and consider the set of elements of f4 whose third coordinate equals 5 times the fourth coordinate plus b. Then it's easy to see that this set is a subspace of f4 if and only if b equals 0. The reason b needs to be 0 is we must have the additive identity in our set U. In this case, the additive identity is the vector consisting of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. For our next example, let's consider the set of all continuous real-valued functions defined on the closed interval from 0 to 1. This is a subset of the set of all functions defined from the closed interval 0, 1 to the real line. It is a subspace because the function 0, the function that's 0 everywhere, is continuous. That's our first condition. We also have that the sum of two continuous real-valued functions is continuous. That's the second condition. And we also know that a constant times a continuous real-valued function is continuous. That's the third condition for being a subspace. Our third example is similar. Now we will consider the vector space of all real-valued functions defined on the real line. Our subset U is a set of all differentiable real-valued functions defined on the real line. And again, this is a subspace. The reason is the constant function 0 is differentiable. So that's our first condition. The sum of two differentiable functions is differentiable. That's our second condition. And a constant times a differentiable function is differentiable. That's our third condition. 
Notice that both of the last two examples, it's rather natural to think about things being subspaces because it reflects properties of continuity and differentiability, namely the sum of two continuous functions is continuous, sum of two differentiable functions is differentiable, and a constant times continuous function is continuous, constant times a differentiable function is differentiable. For our next example, fix a real number b and consider the set of differentiable real-valued functions f on the open interval from 0 to 3, such that f prime of 2 equals b. It's easy to see that this is a subspace of the set of all functions from the open interval 0, 3 to r, if and only if b is 0. Again, the reason we need for b to be 0 is we need the function that's identically 0 to be in this set, and the derivative of that function at 2 is 0. For our next example, the vector space will be C infinity, which is a set of all sequences of complex numbers. Our subset will be the set of all sequences of complex numbers with limit 0. This subset is indeed a subspace of C infinity because it satisfies the three properties. The additive identity of C infinity is a sequence of all zeros. That sequence obviously has limit 0. That's our first condition. If we take two sequences with limit 0, their sum also has limit 0. Thus, the second condition is satisfied. If we take a sequence with limit 0 and multiply it by a constant, we get a new sequence that also has limit 0. That shows that the third condition is satisfied. Thus, the set of all sequences of complex numbers with limit 0 is indeed a subspace of C infinity. If we consider the vector space R2, we can actually list all the subspaces. They're precisely the set consisting of just 0, the set consisting of all of R2, and all lines in R2 through the origin. Now let's go to R3. The subspaces of R3 are precisely the set consisting just of 0, the set consisting of all of R3, all lines in R3 through the origin, and all planes in R3 through the origin. For these last two examples, to verify that these are indeed the only subspaces requires a little bit of theory that we'll learn later. Now we need to define the notion of the sum of a finite collection of subsets of V. So suppose we have subsets U1, U2, up to Um of V. We define their sum to be all elements of the form something in U1 plus something in U2 plus etc. up to we get to something in Um. Although we have defined the sum of arbitrary subsets of V, usually we are interested only in taking the sum of subspaces of V. Here's an interesting result about that. Suppose we have subspaces now, u1 up to um of v. Then their sum is the smallest subspace of v that contains each of them. This is fairly easy to prove. There's a good analogy between sum of subspaces and unions of subsets in set theory. If you think about taking two sets. What is their union? It's the smallest set that contains both of them. Similarly, the sum of two subspaces is the smallest subspace that contains both of them. Now we turn to the notion of direct sum, which will be important later in the course. Suppose we have subspaces u1 up to um of v. Their sum is called a direct sum if each element in the sum can be written in only one way as a sum. If we do indeed have a direct sum, then we use the notation of plus sign with a circle around it to indicate that we really do have a direct sum, again meaning each element of the sum can be written in only one way as an appropriate sum. For example, suppose u is a set of all vectors in F3 whose third coordinate is 0, and w is a subset of F3 consisting of all vectors whose first two coordinates are 0. Both u and w are subspaces of F3, and their, their sum is actually a direct sum. We can write each element x, comma, y, comma, z in only one way, as something in u plus something in w, so we indeed have a direct sum here. Our next result gives a useful condition for checking whether a sum is a direct sum. To be a direct sum, each element has to be written as a sum in just a unique way. What this theorem says is good enough to just check that 0 is, can be written as a sum only in a unique way. Frequently, this is much easier to do. 
The next theorem concerns the sum only of two subspaces, and it gives a really easy condition for checking whether two subspaces are a direct sum. Specifically, two subspaces are a direct sum if and only if their intersection equals zero. Be sure to read the proof of this result in the book. This concludes the video on subspaces.